So we began a three-week fast a week ago, last Monday. How you doing? How many are, just show of hands, how many are like joining us on the journey and trying to set aside some unhealthy things? Good, nice to see that. And, the, and focus, really get our focus, get God right in our crosshairs in the center because, you know, things get in the way, right? I mean, life gets in the way and all kinds of stuff. And before you know it, it's like you get out of habits, you get out of good habits. Well, I haven't been to church in two years and, you know, if I walked in the door, you know, lightning would strike and, you know, it's like, ah, it's just in your head stuff, right? But we do get into bad habits, we get into ruts and... Uh, we have to work to get out of them. One of the hardest things is really get God in our crosshairs and let him be a part of everything of your life. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's like every part of your life and learn to walk with him. And so what we do every year is we challenge ourselves to lay aside the things that hinder and distract. Like Hebrews 12 says, lay aside everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and run with perseverance, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. And so that's kind of what we do. And uh, it's just a pursuit, and we lay aside the distracting and unhealthy and just try and get back to life simple, healthy, productive, and make every decision based on those things. And so a lot of us are involved, and we had some time sharing yesterday with our staff and leadership team about, you know, just what our pursuit, and there's got to be a why to it. There's got to be a reason for you to do this. And it can be as simple as, you know what, I ate too much sugar over the holidays and I just want to get back in shape. Okay. Now put in a spiritual component this year. And uh, as we mentioned last year, most of our New Year's resolutions have to do with me, making me look better on the outside, feel better about myself. You know, it's like self-enhancement, self-improvement. And so this year we're going to challenge you, do what you're going to do. Do it for the reasons that you feel motivated because it's going to take motivation but then we want to add a corporate element to it, right? We want you this year to ask this question. God, what is it you want to do in and through me in 2023? So it's not just myopic. It's not just selfish. It's not just about me looking better, feeling better, getting my finances in order so I can have a, a more peaceful life. It's like, what is your life doing for anybody else? Are you available to God to help anybody else on on the planet? Are your, is your life spent in such a way that, that it's, it's making an impact, right? And so we're building on two verses, and last week we talked about this verse. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And I'm going to sub- submit to you that you don't have a, an idea. I don't have an idea. What God can do me if I just say yes. Here I am, use me. I'm your money, spend me, I'm your bullet, shoot me, use me, use my life. I want to pour it out for you. You created me with a purpose. Am I about accomplishing or fulfilling that purpose? Do I know what that purpose is? Most of us, I would suggest, don't, because most people I talk to, it's like, I don't know. Well, it didn't, he didn't die to just have you sit in a pew the rest of your life. You hear me say that every Sunday. That's not the purpose, just to sit and watch or consume or observe or spectate. It's like we were all given these and spiritual gifts and a personality and talents, and have I activated, have I offered that to him? And so that's what we're challenging. That's our corporate challenge. Would you just say to God during these next two weeks, and then we finish up in two weeks on the 29th, and... We may have donuts for you that day, just so you know. <laughs> and then that evening we have a worship service where we'll share some testimonies about what God did and, and um, just worship Him. But um, I want you to ask Him, like, what, how, how's my life useful? There's a psychological thing, you know, that's become sort of uh, vogue. It's like when you get depressed, the psychologist will ask you, well, let's go do something for somebody else. There's something in that that's more blessed to give than to receive, that when you live out your life for the sake of enhancing or improving or blessing or encouraging others, it does something for you. It fills you up. It it does something that just getting doesn't do for you. And so 
That's the question, Lord. I want my life to mean more. I want my life to, to fulfill the purposes for which you put oxygen in my lungs and, and life in my body. The second verse we're going to build on is this one here, and we'll talk about this today. Jesus says this, You do not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you. Like I commissioned you. Like I chose you to be mine. I came from heaven to earth because I chose you. I didn't just let you go. I came for you and I appointed you. I've commissioned you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. John 15, 16. And so when you hear that, it's like there's a purpose that he has for you. And he's like intent on us fulfilling that and accomplishing that. So here's another thing I want to submit to you this morning, and then we'll get into some of the texts we're going to read today. Um, the greatest natural resource, wasted natural resource on the planet, the greatest sadness is wasted human potential. It's like we are created for more, and we settle for less. And if you're a parent and you see that happening in your kids, you know how that hurts your heart. And I think when God looks down, he goes, what are you guys doing? It's not what I created you for. Um, we were born to be free. We were born for good. We were born to have an abundant life inside and out, to know and live with in God's goodness and his glory. And yet, many of us, we spend years of our lives chasing things uh, that don't satisfy. and We never reach our full potential. I think sometimes because we don't choose God, we don't trust God, and we don't overcome the wounds of our past and become a force for good, we don't pursue his plans and purposes for our lives. So again, I want to challenge you to ask God in 2023, this next two weeks, just set aside Coke, TV. I mean, just the stuff that wastes time, right? Set aside the unhealthy and the, ah, yeah, that didn't do anything for me. Um, and, and kind of get focused and say, okay, what's my life going to be about this year? I want to bear fruit. So today's lesson is this. The title is, uh, what do these two things put together mean? What, 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 go back, what, what is that? Bear, and what's the next one? Ah, if you remember nothing, this is a purpose for which you were created. Okay, sermon over. Go bear fruit that lasts. I've chosen you, I've appointed you to bear fruit that lasts. Fruit bearing lives that last for eternity, that bless others, that nourish and strengthen others. Not just the fruits of the Spirit in my life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, but a life that makes a difference and has a purpose. A life that brings change to the world. So before we get into the main text today, I want to share with you three other passages that Jesus spoke about bearing fruit or not bearing fruit that I hope motivates you. They, it, these three verses motivate me to make a difference, to use my life and to spend it well um, and not to waste time. So these three things Jesus said about bearing fruit. Uh, every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I mean, that's really, he says, by their fruit you'll recognize them. He's talking about false prophets and all that kind of stuff. But then there's this one liner right there, you know, it's like, I, be, I, I created you to bear fruit. Fruit that lasts. All right, let's see what the next one says. Early in the morning as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. So he goes by a fig tree and he's going to grab some figs. But the fig tree doesn't have any fruit, right? He found nothing on it except leaves. And so he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. And the apostles realized that and said, whoa, what's up with that? How cool is that? And he goes, yeah. The lesson on that is something else. He goes, yeah, if you said to this mountain move, if you had faith, you could do the same thing. They were just impressed that he was able to do that so quickly, but they missed the point that he was looking for fruit and there was no fruit. Next one. Then he told this parable. Man had a fig tree. I guess he liked figs. Uh, it was grown in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it and did not find any, so... 
He said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming and looking for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up oxygen and soil? What purpose, what good is it? It looks good, but it's not beneficial. It's looked good, but nobody can get anything good from it. Sermon of the man said, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it, I'll fertilize it, and if it, doesn't, if it bears fruit, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then it's a waste. You see, so these are sounds like harsh things, right? It's like cut it down, throw it under the fire. Why waste the soil? Why waste the oxygen? See, so I'm submitting to you a thought that I find from Scripture that motivates me that I don't spin my wheels chasing some rabbit trail, that I pursue what God has for me, that I become who God's created me to be. Because guess what? Your experience right now is really a culmination of your effort, your intent, your pursuit. What you're experiencing as a believer, if you're a believer in Christ, is a result and a reflection of the intent and the effort you've put in. If you don't like it, guess what? See, God has more for you. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And I'm on a freaking roller coaster ride since I said yes to Jesus and went all in that I can't believe. And, and I didn't do anything but say yes. White-knuckled, scared to death, but I'm going to let you be God. Here I am. And I think if you do that and you pursue it and you dig in, you know, we're going to look at some, the main passage right now that Jesus talks about. It's like it gives us some, some things to do, some very practical things to do that I hope you'll implement in your fast, that you'll ask God what he's prepared you for, that your life is spent doing things and becoming who he created you to be because that's where you're going to be most fulfilled. That's where you're going to be most satisfied being who he created you. That's where you're going to be free. You're going to be alive. You're not just going to be surviving, helping make somebody else rich, paying taxes, going to jobs, and just coming home every day, twiddling your thumbs, going, man, life sucks. Life's boring. You see, you're created more for that. And it's not just showing up for church on Sunday. It's living this purpose-filled life every day. All right, so now we're motivated. Um, Matthew 13 Maybe you, if you know the Bible, you know this story. Um, looks like our computer went down. Matthew 13, I'll read it to you. Parable of the sower, right? The same day Jesus went out of the house, sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it and he taught them while all the po- people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, first parable, a farmer went out to sow his seed. Everybody understands that because that was a day of farming. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, remember that, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell among rocky places where it did not have much soil, but it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, uh, the plant was scorched and withered, and it died because it had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, and the seed grew up, oh, we got it, and choked the plants. Somebody, where are we at? Now I lost myself. <laughs> did, we do the, did we do the weeds? Choked the plant. Still other seed fell on good soil, thank you, where it produced a crop, 160, 30 times what was sown. See, that's, that's our life. It's like... Sow your life. Give it to God. Let him use it. Uh, Whoever has ears, let him hear. And so apostles didn't understand this stuff, and they're scratching their head, and he comes back and he explains the parable later. Um, But basically, we got four soils, right? That's what we need to know. Four soils. What's the first one? Path, which is basically hard soil, right? Didn't penetrate. Birds just picked up the seed and ate it. Second soil was? Shallow soil or rocky soil, just shallow. Third soil was thorny or weedy. 
and for soil was good. Okay. So Jesus explains it to them, and he'll explain it to us. Let's go ahead and look at that. Listen to, then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, there's the seed, the gospel, and does not understand that the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown into their heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. Hard soil, impenetrable. Um, number two, the seed falling on the rocky soil refers to someone who hears the word and once, at once receives it with joy. Woohoo! But since it has no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And then the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, they choke the word and make it unfruitful. And then there's one good seed that falls on good soil, it refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. And then the yielding is 160, 30 times what was sown. So it reminds me of one other thing that Jesus says. He says, unless you're, you're the seed, it's sown in your heart. Unless you die, you remain just a single. But if you die to the things that you think are, and you just live for Jesus, you'll bear, that, that seed will grow, right? He says, even your faith is like a mustard seed. Like, it'll grow and everybody will feed from it. Like, your life will be so well spent because it's not just about you. But you've got to die to yourself and live for him. So now let's get back to the soils here because it's really all about the soil. This is, if you get nothing else, bear fruit. It's all about the soil. Do you have anything to do with the soil in your life? Absolutely. In fact, you have everything to do with the soil. He's going to sow a seed. You're going to hear the gospel, and whether it grows in your life really is dependent, I think, a large part on, on us. Now, the Holy Spirit will help us. He'll help till the soil and the hard ground in your life. And, and this is why I always pray for a soft heart. I don't want to have a hard heart. An impenetrable that God can't speak to me. If he showed up on my doorstep and said, Dan, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, I would say no or I don't even know you, or I have better things for you, would you give up this for, for, would you like to upgrade, you know? Instead of doing drugs, would you like to be free? Instead of being addicted to X, would you like to be free? Instead of, you know, living in misery, would you like to be free? No. Then it's like, what, what can we do, right? Lead a horse to water, can't make him drink, right? It's like, there's nothing God can do for that person. So it's like, what does a person have to do about the condition of his soil, his heart? Well, the Bible talks about dig up the hard ground, right? The fallow ground that's it's become hard because people have trampled on it. It's like a path. And I understand that. You understand that? You ever been hurt? So how do you dig up that hurt, hard soil that's been trampled on because you don't trust anymore? You don't want to open up your heart again. Ouch. But the seed can't grow with a hard heart. Now I'm stuck. I want it, but I don't know how to do this. And so Holy Spirit, help me. And that's why I say during this fast, if we're going to bear fruit, right, if that's what Jesus wants to do in your life, in my life, the seed has got to go deep. It's got to grow roots. And, and I have to help it. And... Uh, and so, I think in, the, in a hard heart, you know, I'm not going to give you all the answers. I just want you to see what Jesus says and hear. I mean, I'm not the Bible answer, man. I just know I struggle with these things, too. And I want to bear fruit. So, Jesus, if I have a hard heart, what do I need to do about it? Ask Jesus that during your next couple weeks. We're going to keep digging into this bear fruit thing next week as well. There's a lot of other passages that talk about this. And so arrogance and pride are indicative of a hard heart. Do I have that attached? Is that my, is that my problem? 
Um, the, the word's not penetrating. I'm bored. I'm dry. God, give me a soft heart. The second soil is a shallow soil, and we probably, we may even like transition from one to the next, right? Go from hard to shallow, right? It's like, that's a little deeper than I was last week or last year. But now it's still shallow. Like it's not, I'm not going to endure. I don't have resiliency. I don't have commitment. I don't have perseverance. It's, it's when it feels good, I'm in. But what if it doesn't feel good? What if the sun comes out and it gets, it gets hot? What if some of my friends' persecution becomes because you say you want to follow Jesus and they think you're crazy? And so now what do I do? My kids don't want to go with me. My parents, my wife, and my husband don't want to accompany me. What do I do if I have to go it alone? Am I going to go it alone? Do I have enough depth or commitment or conviction or confidence that it's true and the word of God is real that I'm going to go it alone if I have to but it's I can't stop and so the enemy's job is to right put obstacles in your way detours distractions all kinds of stuff to get you from staying true to the course and growing and bearing fruit um So am I in it just when it's convenient, or am I in it for the long haul? And then we got weedy things that will choke out the life of God in you, right? Concerns and cares of the world. I mean, uh, yeah, so I prayed this morning, Lord, tell me when to kick you in the booty today and tell me when to be really compassionate. <laughs> Because this stuff is real and it happens to all of us, but sometimes we need a little, right? And uh, culture, convenience, comfort, these are all weeds. Weeds don't have to be bad. They can just be distractions. Ready for it? My kids' ball games. The championship that's on TV right now. Uh, I'm sleepy. I mean, there's all kinds of things that will stop us from being where we need to be and doing what we need to do. That's all I'm saying. And you're going to have to weed through that stuff and cut out some weeds if you're ever going to bear fruit. Um, sometimes just hanging around, it's, it's where you hang around that can be unhealthy. You know, I'm thinking of a forest, right? When the forest is overgrown, the little new guys don't get enough sunshine, and they look pretty anemic, and then they get this peste. How do they call that in English? Uh, pestilence, yeah. Right? And they, they get all funky, and then they're unhealthy, and they don't, they don't bear fruit, and if they do bear fruit, it's, you don't want to eat it, right? It's like, and so I think, who do I hang around? Who's influencing my life? Who's, what's the major influence on my mind, my heart, my life? And it's like, I'm not getting any sunshine from God. It's like, I need to clear the path a little bit. You know what clearing the path looks like? It's commitments like, I'm going to be in the presence of God every Sunday morning with my brothers and sisters because there's stuff that happens here that doesn't happen anywhere else. There's nothing that feeds my soul out there except the Word of God. And you open that, I, I pray every day. In the presence of God. I had a kid who came to church last week. week um, a friend of my son's, and he was in town, never been to church. And he said, yeah. So he came down to ski and took Sunday off. Wanted to come see what Micah's dad did for a living. <laughs> kind of stuff they talk about. So it's kind of funny, you know, the conversation with somebody who doesn't get this at all. And so he shows up and he sits here in the front row and uh, something starts happening to him. It's all emotional. He's all teary-eyed. This, this is his words. I don't know what's going on with me. I'm like, schizophrenic. What's, like, what's going on with me? Holy cow. Here's what's going on. Your soul is in the presence of its creator where it was born. 
and you know it, your soul knows it, right? It's hungry. It's hungry for the presence of God. You, brother, sister, are hungrier for the presence of God than you know, and you're born to bear fruit. But there's things that are just cloud in your life, and you've got to break through those things. He didn't know what was going on. I'll tell you the coolest. And then he goes, so he's home having a conversation with my wife after the service, and, and uh, he goes, you think, you know, like, I don't know about it. I mean, some, she goes, just ask God to reveal himself to you. God's not playing hide and seek or hard to get. And would you, if you have the courage, just ask God to, if you're real, show yourself to me. He goes, like, what, is he going to hit me in the head with a bird or something? <laughs> I mean, like, how does he do that? Like, I mean, is this like, right? And then is he going to do X, Y, and Z? And he's coming up with all these things, right? Next day he goes skiing, and he comes home, and he goes, big eyes, I think uh, God's trying to tell me something. Oh, yeah, what happened? He hit me in the head with a bird. <laughs> and then the next thing he did was the next thing he, that came out of his mouth, like, is God going to do this, this? And it's just like, Yep. And Tammy goes, yeah, I think maybe he uh, is trying to get your attention. You see, we were made for God in his presence, and our soul knows that, and we come alive, and this is what feeds us, and you're going to have to cut away some weeds that are just stealing your joy, stealing your, and that means, you know, like these classes. It's like fellowship. It's like daily Bible study. I'm tired. You've got to do it. You want to be alive? I mean, nobody... You have no one to blame but yourself for any regret in your life because you didn't do what you needed to do to be healed, to overcome, to become who God created you to be, to find a purpose. And so it's just like I want to challenge you to reconsider. Don't let culture, comfort, convenience, all these things be the dictator of who you are and what you do. You choose. You decide who you want to be. And who do you want to become? And I want to challenge you to let God take the lead. Just say yes and see what he does next. And keep following him. And don't let him, the enemy or life get in your way. I had four kids. Three of them, two of them played baseball. Guess what? Little League started playing baseball on Sunday morning. Darn, I'm the coach. Two star players. Every parent thinks that, right? <laughs> we go to church first. Not because I'm the pastor. Because this is what's right. The culture used to acknowledge these things and they wouldn't, you know, do things on Sunday. But now they encroach and we succumb to it. We don't have to. So guess what? The coach wasn't there and the two-star players weren't there. We're at church. They're in their uniforms, waiting for, we'll get there. But we got priorities that aren't going to, I'm not going to let the enemy or the culture steal. That's us. I don't know. So, we probably go from hard soil and we have to dig up our pride and our arrogance and our wounds and ask God to heal us and to make us soft. And then we go to shallow and we go in short spurts, and when it's good and convenient and it's happy, then I'm in, and when it gets tough, I bail. We've got to keep going deeper, and then we've got to weed through things that choke out the life of God in order for us to have good soil. And he will not just sow the seed, he will water it, and he will shine on it, his love. And you'll experience God as you dig in, guys. Just in your own personal walk, right? I mean, I know, here's what God wants, I'm convinced of, and here's what I want for you. It's not like just show up and listen to some dude's talk. Um, check a box, call it church. It's about you and God. And he wants you to know and experience him in a real practical way daily. And that's what we want for you. We're not trying to play God in your life. We're trying to be an encouragement to you and open up Scripture when we come together. We want to worship Him together, and then we want to talk about truth and challenge and encourage each other as the Holy Spirit works in your life because He knows where you're at, and He knows what you need. He knows your name, and He knows your language. He's just waiting for you to say, God, would you do something in me? 
Would you hit me in the head with a bird if it takes that? Or a two by four, wherever it takes, right? Because I need to know I'm dry, I'm hurt. You know, am I shallow? Am I weak? Am I weedy? Am I... So till up the hard soil. Fertilize the shallow soil. Stick with it. Dedicate time and space for the seed to grow in your life. Commit to Sundays, midweek. Do the work. Cut out the weeds. Don't let the world dictate. Don't be distracted. There's so many lights and sounds and interests and competing values. And you got to choose. So, here's how we uh, end things at Outlook. Um, we have five communion tables because our greatest... When we come together, it's been this way since Jesus left, but sometimes after 2,000 years of doing church and Christianity, we add to it a lot of stuff. It really became about people of God gathering together, encouraging one another, and then remembering what Jesus did for them on the cross. Because that changed everything. And it should change everything in you, too. Right? And me. And then we have prayer, where we get to pray for one another, because it's about family. It's not about liturgy or tradition. It's about the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the truth of re the reality of God in you and your response. And so we just want to respond the way we should as family. Like, hey, you need anything? You need prayer? You need encouragement? Hey, what's your name? What? You want to know my name? Yeah, actually we do. <laughs> We want to know you. We want to know all about you. We want to know you, what your gift it is. We want to know what your strength is, what you bring to the table, because Jesus said, unless we all do our part, we will never grow and be mature as a church body, as a, as a, as a kingdom enterprise. And so he's, his, I believe his spirit's calling you to step forward and say yes, right? And so before you do anything, just for the next two weeks, I challenge you, if you didn't start last week, start this week. Just say, you know what, I'm going to cut out, just start weeding, doing some weeding in my life. Make room for God. Let the light shine in. Let him penetrate my heart. And I'm going to ask him, Lord, what is it you have for me in 2023? Let's just get started. What's the next, what, what can you do in and through me, God? You see, I think he's hardwired you, not just with your talents, your personality, your looks, you know, your abilities, but I think he's hardwired you with a passion to do what he created you to do. And you're going to come alive when you're about doing that. It's like, oh, that's what I was created for. It's not just making money and building empires. Ecclesiastes says everything else is just meaningless, so chasing in a, after the wind. Uh, you can build skyscrapers, but it's, not just about that if you don't know Jesus, right? What does it gain a man to gain the whole world, you know? And not experience heaven and eternity. Fruit that lasts. This is about eternity and you're eternal. And uh, we got work to do on planet Earth. You're the light, you're the salt of the earth. Jesus says, now that you've come out of the darkness into the light, let's go shine that on the world. Let's go push back darkness. You see, this is our calling. This is our purpose as sons and daughters of God, is to make things as good as they can be on this planet and to stop evil as much as possible and to create things that are beneficial and to be productive, that my life is spent making a difference in your life. And don't compete and don't compare with anybody else. I'm not Einstein. I'm not Rockefeller, and I can, you know. But what good would it do to cure cancer and, and go not be with Jesus? And everybody that gets cured of cancer is going to die of something else and not be with Jesus. So it's like, what did I do? But let's cure cancer and let's be with Jesus. <laughs> let's do both and, right? Let's push back darkness, let's find cures, let's, let's spend our life not just about consuming or hoarding or, you know, 
My resolution, and I encourage you, is just, God, what can you do through me this year to make a difference in somebody else's life? My neighbor. Do I know him? There's a good place to start. But just ask the question, would you? And so I'm going to invite the prayer team forward, and we're going to, here's how we do it. We just turn down the lights. We play some music, because this is you and Jesus now having a conversation heart-to-heart, one-on-one at the foot of the cross. I died for you, that you would, and I appointed you. I chose you to bear fruit that would last. I can do in you what you have never thought or heard or seen before. Imagine unimaginable things if you'll let me. And so I encourage you to take the communion cups and say thank you for his sacrifice for you and then offer yourself back to him and say, yes, do it, whatever you want, I'm in. If you don't know Jesus today and this whole thing is new to you, that's cool, that's good, welcome, I'm glad you're here. Uh, You just sit and meditate and pray and think Reflect. Again, let, let God feed your soul with His love for you, His desire for you. And take a step of faith and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you in 2023. I'm going to seek you to find out if you're real. Again, our team is forward. If you want to just pray with somebody, we want to make time for that too. And then we'll close here shortly with a song.